Let's bring in Chris Miller right now, the aforementioned Chris Miller, kind enough to pick up the cost and all those free rate on test kits. Chris, thank you so much. You're a generous man. Listen, man, it's always fantastic to have your name associated with radon testing. I mean, that's the dream come true, to be truthful. Really yeah. is. You know, you know, you're just helping people buy the boatloads. You're such a good man. Uh, Chris, uh, by the way, his mom, Carol, is a, uh, an elected congresswoman from the southern end of the state. And uh, Chris is a candidate for governor, also involved in the car business himself. Uh, Chris, we haven't talked to you in a few months. Tell us a little bit about your background, sir. Well, um, I think the best way to... Um, dive into that one is, is that when I was 10 and a half years old, I told my dad I wanted a pair of Air Jordan tennis shoes. And when he found out they cost $125, he told me to get a job. <laughs> and I've been working ever since. The only job I could find as a 10 and a half year old kid is a paper route. And woke up every day delivering newspapers for two and a half years. And I literally have had a job ever since after that. Did manual labor on a bison farm and, you know, built fence and, um, you know, welded together a corral for buffalo and um did barbed wire fencing and baling hay and then you know went to college worked in the summer times and uh, eventually have built a uh a business a set of businesses not only in west virginia but we have businesses in west virginia and tennessee in north carolina in virginia and in kansas and i currently uh, up until the end of last year was the president of all of our different enterprises and managed uh, 600 people and about $750 million in revenue. So that, that's, that's the long and the short of my uh, you know, business career. And I'm married with three kids and two great Dane dogs and live in Huntington. Nice. Did you ever get those Air Jordans? I did, man. I bought Air Jordans, and oddly enough, it led to a, a, a little bit of a collection of them. So. Well, you know, uh, Michael Jordan's autographed 1985 Nike Air Jordan 1 sold at auction in May of 2020 for $672,000. That's incredible. Right? He, he was an interesting, interesting guy. I still don't think we're ever going to see anybody like him on the NBA courts. I think he was the greatest NBA player ever, regardless of what LeBron James does. You know, I got to see him play. He was with the Durham Bulls. He did his baseball thing for a while. Mm -hmm. I lived in Prince William County, Virginia, and they they played a game and completely sold out. Um, but I watched Michael Jordan at bat. He's got a big swing, but he wasn't very good. <laughs> 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 That's funny. Yeah, I mean, he, he was a he was a uh, good baseball player, not a great baseball player. Um, you know, really an athlete, but I think there's a little bit more behind the story on why he wound up playing baseball. He may or may not have been uh, forced out of the NBA for a little bit. No, there's a, there is a, the conspiracy theory that was out there. Uh, everyone involved uh, in that, in David Stern, Michael Jordan, all swear it's nothing more than a conspiracy theory. No truth to it whatsoever. But it is yeah, out there. Uh, it does circulate. Yeah, that's normally, the, that's normally the way conspiracy theories are handled. Indeed. Chris, let's talk about your campaign. Uh, are you are you at the point where you're actively ramped up and rocking, or are you still waiting a little bit till you go full speed? Oh, no, I am I am rocking and rolling as of the beginning of this year. I spent four months the end of last year re, uh, structuring and reorganizing all of our businesses so I could step away and campaign full time, and we are now full speed ahead. Um, I'm actually in Morgantown today. Um, brought in a, a speaker for um, a Holocaust event because mm. there was a survey recently where 18, um, it was like 1,800 sample sized college grads in 2018 when it was surveyed that 60% um, of college graduates either A, believe the Holocaust didn't happen, or B, thought the death numbers were over exaggerated. So, brought a speaker in that's one of the founding members of the Holocaust Museum to talk at universities around the state. Um, you know, we're in West Virginia Wesleyan uh, tonight. We were in WVU yesterday evening, um, you know, doing that. But um, that, that's kind of a separate thing. Um, the campaign itself is up and, you know, full speed ahead. And there is a major opportunity for the state of West Virginia if we play our cards exactly right. But we need to be honest about the state of the state currently and the problems that we're facing, too, because um, West Virginia has a serious set of financial problems coming down the pike. Can you elaborate the, on those, Chris? Yes. The, the um, expansion of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, led to Medicare and Medicaid expansion through rural states all around the country. And because of our changing demographics and an aging population, our DHHR's budget is going to continue to balloon up until, depending on the actuarial model you look at, between 8 and 12 years from now, it affects the bond rating statewide 
makes the cost of government go way up. And we won't have a productive supporting tax base below it to justify that dramatic increase in cost. And that's where the austerity, the deep cuts, and the financial tailspin starts. And there is one solution and one solution only aside from that, and that is to start now, get out ahead of it, and grow our way out of it. And we need to add about two hundred to 300,000 people to the state of West Virginia to survive. The good news is, is that we actually have a chance to do that. Um, in March of 2020, I started a data company because I was really curious to see what was going to happen after a pandemic. And the data clearly tells us that we are in the beginning stages of a demographic shift around the country. And it's not as simple as California to Texas and New York and New Jersey to Florida. Much more ingrained in a bunch of stuff. But a lot of it has to do with economics. And a lot of it has to do culturally. You know, when we locked a bunch of people down in urban areas surrounded by concrete, they couldn't go to the gym, they couldn't get their haircuts, they couldn't go to comedy shows. Surprisingly, access to health care was a really shining issue inside of the data, which is, you know, if you had, uh, you know, an elect- if you needed elective procedure during the pandemic, you were tough out of luck, right? You had to wait forever. If you needed gallstone surgery because you had gallstones, you were waiting three times longer than normal. And more importantly, if you had a baby during the pandemic, and then had complications after you left the hospital. There's case after case after case all around the country of people waiting 9 to 11 hours in the ERs just to be reseen again. So all that stuff, aside from some economic factors as well, are creating the movement in our country. And coincidentally, three of the four fastest growing states post-pandemic all have one thing in common, and that is a zero state income tax. So there are economic factors kind of driving this. And what happened is the Trump tax cuts got rid of the SALT deductions. And so it used to be that you were able to deduct all your state-level taxes from your federal ticket before you sent your check in. Well, those deductions went away. The rates went down. And so that economically is one of the things kind of forcing the movement. But primarily speaking with West Virginia, the way that we capitalize on this is, is that we have what people want, especially based on the data which is we're surrounded by hills and trees and rivers and streams. We have a very, very high quality of life and a lower cost of living. And people are looking for something different now. And we have what people want. So we have to learn how to market that and differentiate ourselves from all the other states in the union. And if you look at what's going on geopolitically in the world, there's a reason why Putin is in Ukraine. Putin wrote his senior dissertation for his Ph.D. on controlling the flow of energy into Europe for political and economic might. And Ukraine is the direct line for natural gas and wheat into Europe. And so he's forecasted this. And coincidentally, now you've got countries like Germany and Sweden and um, Swiss that are all saying, like, we can't power our countries and keep our old people warm using windmills. And so we have to start burning coal again. And it goes back to West Virginia. And if you look at who we are and what we can accomplish, we have an abundance of coal, we have an abundance of natural gas, and we haven't even explored the Marcellus Shale completely yet. We also have an abundance of lumber, and hardwood is going to be a part of what happens in the moving economy, too. And lastly, our state just so happens to be the birthplace of water for the East Coast. We've got more water than any other state in the Union. We have an incredible amount of miles of river. We also own the Ohio River to the border of Ohio, and the greatest wars of our great-grandkids' lifetimes are not going to be fought over diamonds or dollars or gold or cryptocurrencies. It's going to be fought over water. You can see right now large corporations and China buying up fertile farmland around the world close to water. And then if you look at what's happening out west in our country, the Arizona Reservoir is drying up, the Colorado River is drying up, the dams in uh, Nevada are shrinking down to the point where they're uncovered bodies the mafia threw in there to build Las Vegas. Allegedly. California's in a... <laughs> yeah, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. California has major water issues. That's not allegedly. That's true. And West Virginia is sitting on more water than anybody else. And I think it's about time that we leverage that for political and economic might. And when we play our cards exactly the right way, you can capture the power that flows through our state continuously by putting turbines in the rivers. And you can connect them straight into the utility grid system of municipalities and use that to drive down the cost of our power. And then we ought to get into water storage and build big lakes and use that as well to get into something called forced or pushed hydro. And then all of a sudden, you've created a system when you combine the coal and the natural gas and our potential for nuclear 
with hydroelectric power, and we can drive down the cost of power for our people and be the state in the union that has the cheapest power out there and use that for an economic engine for growth as well because money will flow coincidentally to the places that's most welcome, kind of like water. And if you're the state in the union that has the cheapest power out there, people will come. And that's what I want to accomplish. That's the plan. And that is the exact reason why I'm getting involved in this because I don't need a job, right? I've got a bunch of those. But our state is in this sweet spot where we have major financial problems coming, but we also have the potential for solutions with the exact right leadership. And we can change this state. We can do something incredible. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> Good morning. I, a thousand people is 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 a lot of people to add. And, yes, it is. And the, the plans you're talking about, the long range, that's a lot of investment. We're talking about hydroelectric dams. We're talking about you know, just kind of a, a, a massive sea change of, of new infrastructure. At the same time, you're talking about having a, uh, a financial crisis coming, whether through DHHR or, or whatever, at the same time talking about eliminating the personal income tax. Can all of that happen at the same time? Um, you have to do it step by step, right? And if you are going to adjust one thing, you have to adjust another. And the infrastructure starts small and then builds out. Um, we are currently sitting on a large surplus. What we do with that surplus is one thing. We are going to be moving into a time where energy is going to continue to be more expensive. And so as long now, when as you say surplus, continue, you mean surplus financially, money? Financially at the state level, yes. Okay. Um, now, now, some of that stuff, when you really dig into it, has already been appropriated and or spent. But the potential for managing our state's costs currently and collecting enough revenue to do some bigger projects and understanding that there are a bunch of federal dollars out there for some of these, you know, quote unquote, green energy projects and hydro classifies themselves as one of that. There is ways to creatively find the funding to do this. And plus, you know, you look at uh, Lake Norman, for example. Lake Norman was built by Duke Energy in the late 70s. It's a man-made lake. Duke Energy did that because they, they saw the potential for the hydro. They also saw the potential for pairing it up against nuclear. And look at the economic development that occurred all around that because of that investment. And so there's opportunities for public-private partnerships, too. There's ways to take care of all this stuff. You but just got to be very, very creative, and you have to understand business deals. How does a state with fewer than 2 million residents, I believe, ac across the board, attract, grow 300,000 new, uh, more population in a state that, let's be honest, is sort of geographically challenged? We have a, a, an abundance of natural resources that are located in places where it's very difficult to build anything, right? The the terrain is vertical and and uh, and difficult to 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 develop. So, what is the plan there? I mean, three hundred thousand is a is a big number. Yeah, it, it's so. The idea is it's the growth that will slow the the changing of the bond ratings. And so, if we're able in in its ten years between two hundred and three hundred thousand people. If you think about the math behind that, that's 20,000 people a year for 10 years. It's not as crazy as you think. And we just have to show the growth trajectory to prevent the changing of the bond ratings. And so you've got a market. And we also know because of, like I said, the data that the demand is there. And so you can use digital data to find the people that you want to bring in around the country and at the same time have a very aggressive business development, economic development office inside of the state that is helping create these type of connections with businesses and market why in the world we're the place to come and bring them in. So it's a twofold approach from economic development and finding businesses and also then marketing to people. It is totally doable. I do this every single day in my businesses. It's just on a larger scale. Is there a they plan out there? I'm is, telling you right now, the data is out there. The people are looking and want a change. Is there a plan B if the Green New Deal and the, the, the current push away from fossil fuels um, gains the traction that, that the current administration seems to think it will? So um, they're not going anywhere. Natural gas and coal isn't going anywhere, anywhere and neither, neither is the demand and neither is the price. 
we're moving into a time where energy is going to become even more expensive. And, you know, the technology we're using, everybody's plugging into the utility grid system. And as it turns out, we have a failing utility grid system around the country. And we don't have a utility grid system that can handle 10% of the cars on the road today being converted to electric vehicles without causing massive brownouts and blackouts. And so what does that mean? That means that we have to have base load provider energy to prevent that. And guess what is base load? It's everything that we have. It's coal, it's natural gas, it's also nuclear, and it's also hydro. So we're going to have to adapt and we're going to have to do this, but the market is there for it. Okay, so put this in the form of a, a plan for me. Uh, I, we wave the wand, you're governor, you've got the mansion for at least four years. What are the steps you put in place to start this working? So you start by marketing, and you start by changing the culture of government. I think it's about time that we uh, create a government that looks at its citizens like customers and not taxpayers beholden to the government entity. And that's what we're going to have to do to start recruiting and bringing in businesses. We're going to have to have the right culture in place. Where you start from the energy platform side of things is that you start with turbines in the rivers, and they connect straight into the utility grid systems of municipalities. And that starts driving down the cost of power, and that's just a start. And then you start working on coal production. You start working on doing a better job of getting it, getting it outside of the mountains. You start looking at exploration of natural gas. You start looking at where you're going to start the permitting process for nuclear. And you start adding all that stuff up together, and that creates the action that creates the additional economic development. So That's where you start. <clears throat> drill down a little deeper. Let's do that. If we're going to change the culture of government, which is, is a fine thing to say, how does one do that from, from the, the governor's chair? Uh, you've, you've got a legislature <clears throat> to deal with, and, and how, how does one do that? Very, very good question. Uh, with a lot of hard work. And we all need to really re really realize that this is a 70 hour a week type of job. It is gonna be a full core press, but literally, it starts and ends by explaining to everybody that we have a serious set of financial catastrophes coming if we don't adapt to what needs to happen right now. If we do not do this stuff, these financial pressures are incredibly real and will hurt the state. So we can't keep going at the rate that we're going. We cannot, we cannot accept the status quo any longer. And people are dying for leadership. They're dying for a change. You, know, you talk to people all around the state. Like one of the things that pops up all the time is the cost of power. And you, know, you see it over and over and over again. And if we can show people that this is what we can accomplish, and we can. I've read on this. I've researched all this stuff. You can get everybody moving in the right direction. People are dying for it. People don't want to wake up and just, like, be apathetic and go to work and hate what they're doing. Like, they need a purpose, and they want to be excited, and they want to realize they can accomplish something bigger than themselves. So it starts with leadership. I mean, I think it's pretty simple. This sounds like you're disappointed by the what happened at our last legislative session. Some would argue that there was quite a bit of change in leadership that came out of that. So uh, I think rephrasing that a little bit, I, I don't say I dis was disappointed. Um, it's a move in the right direction. We had a tax cut. It's probably the largest tax cut in the history of our state. That, 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 that's a really, really good thing. It, that is a really good thing. Um, I think money in the hands of the people is way better than money in the hands of the government. And you know, being totally honest as well, there's other things that we're going to have to restructure when it comes to bringing the people to us too. And, you know, we've got an education system that needs revamped. We have teachers. There's a shortage of teachers all around, the, all around the country. And it's affecting us here in West Virginia, too. I think there's a way to restructure the Department of Education to pay teachers more and drive down the cost of education because we're already currently, because of our structure, in the top 18 in the country when it comes to dollars spent per kid. Yet we have very, very poor results. And a lot of that has to do with the structure of having 55 counties with 55 boards of education and 55 layers of bureaucracies. And then the teachers on the ground that are you know, stuck filling out paperwork and doing all this ridiculous stuff over and over again. Um, we, we're going, if we're going to bring people to us, we do have to restructure the education system and find a way to pay our teachers more too. But if, you know, back to your original question, there's nothing I'm really disappointed in when it comes to the economic development side of stuff and tax cuts because it was a tax cut, right? That, that, that's a good thing in my mind. 
but we've got a lot more work to do because where we are going, we cannot sustain what we are doing because of what's going to happen with the cost of government in the future. And it all boils back down to that. Like every problem that we have, you know, you think about health care, for example. Our health care costs continue to rise up, and a lot of it has to do with not having a large enough base of, of healthy people paying into an insurance system. And so if we add people to the state that are all, like, not government workers, but we're adding people that are a part of a productive side of sector of the economy, then they're getting private health insurance, and that is a higher pool of people paying into a system that then drops down the cost of health care. And so all this stuff is tied together, economically speaking. It's all there. Chris Miller is our guest candidate for governor here in West Virginia. And uh, I think about the third appearance for Chris on the program. Uh, you mentioned the cost of health care, Chris, and PEIA was center attention this uh, year in the legislative session because they had to change the premium structure. And after a long time without a premium increase, had to readjust the mix back to 80-20, which resulted in increased premiums for pretty much everybody who is on PEIA. If you were to be the next governor, would you continue that 80-20 split as is mandated by law, or would you prefer the state kept backfilling and keeping the premiums lower for state employees? Well, the only, like I said, the only real way to drive down the cost is to raise the premium pool of private pay insurers. And that's something that needs to be the focus. And it just so happens to relate back to the major problem the state is, is facing when it comes to our bond ratings and our increasing in costs in the DHHR. Um, when you're talking about health care as well, um, you know, all this stuff factors back, like I said, to the population. PEIA is going to be a problem, and we need to make sure and keep that system in place as we move forward. But as of right now, because of the increasing health care costs, pretty soon PEIA is going to cost us an extra $40 million a year above and beyond what is allocated through general revenue in our budget. And then after that, in about nine years, it moves to about $90 million above and beyond what is allocated through general revenue. And that is huge in a state that has a $4.4 billion budget. That's huge. $90 million of that $4.4 billion budget is huge. And so you have to do something. The real way to handle this is to grow our way out of it. Because if not, we're stuck in a position as a state where we have to cut all kinds of things. And that gets really, really ugly. So it all relates back to that. Like everything that we're talking about relates back to the actions that we have to take right now to grow our state's population, to prevent stuff like PEIA from exploding, to prevent stuff like our DHHR's budget from getting to the point where it raises the cost of government and makes everything even more expensive. The other issue that we're facing financially is is that the road bond bill that we passed, we're only going to be able to complete about two-thirds of that project because of interest rates. The timing that we released it pre-pandemic, the changing labor costs that have happened over the past three years, and um, uh, I said interest rates. Um, but then the other one is is that inflation. And so all of that has led to increasing costs. That means that we're only going to be able to finish about two-thirds of the overall projects. So now we got a roads issue, too. Guess how we fix that? Grow the population. It is like every single problem that we face can be solved by focusing on forward-thinking population growth. It's what we have to do to survive. It's all tied together, guys. Do you have time for a couple more questions, or do you have to go? Sure. No, man, I'm good. I'm enjoying this. uh, My producer, Colin, just sent me a a text that said, hey, uh, be sure to ask him about the rough and rowdy boxing match. What's the story behind that? Oh, my gosh. So um, I come from a long line of boxers. And my dad and my uncle were boxers. My grandfather was a boxer. And I spent some time as a young kid doing that. You know, we always grew up around it and decided about the age of 35 that I was going to start competing. And so I started competing and had a goal where I was just going to stick with amateur. That was the deal that I had with my wife because I had to wear headgear. And started competing and getting pretty good at it and started winning tournaments and um, going up to – Brooklyn and Gleason's gym and fighting won um, their tournament up there, won the North Carolina, or the, sorry, the Carolina Gloves two years in a row down in uh, uh, North Carolina, went out to, you know, West and fought and worked my way up to being ranked number one in the country through nice. USA Boxing in the Masters Division in 2022. And then I got, had an injury in a fight. I got my bicep tendon snapped 
mm-hmm. in August in a fight in Brooklyn and finished the fight, won the fight. That was one of the most excruciating things I've ever been through. Had surgery and was going to retire. And then I got this opportunity to fight in the rough and rowdy. And I thought, hmm, this could be a fun publicity kind of thing. And, you know, finish up my boxing career doing something totally different than I'd never done before. And it got incredible attention. It was spread all across the country. You know, Dave Portnoy was there talking about it. Um, it was an absolute riot of a time. The fight wound up being a draw. So this, this kind of haunts me a little bit. My last fight ever wound up being a draw. But it was a majority draw. Two of the judges had it as a draw. One of the judges had me as winning. And so that's called a majority draw. But we put on an absolute show, had an absolute blast at the time. The entire stadium was just rocking. It was awesome. It happened in Charleston and um, went out with a bang. So well, we've got you the, can see the fight if you want to. It's online. We've got the poster up on the screen. It says six three two hundred and fifty five pounds. It's not it's it's not every state where you can elect a six three two hundred and fifty five pound governor and the guy that preceded him office would call him tiny. Well, here's even worse. That is totally there was that was a misprint, so they, uh-huh. they had to redo the poster. I'm five foot ten and a half and two hundred and fifteen pounds. <laughs> but so I think I think it also shows your record at zero zero. Is that what I'm looking at yeah, there so, in the poster? <laughs> yeah, because the rough and rowdy is semi pro. Ah. And so you're actually paid to perform in it. Mm-hmm. And so um, I having an amateur record, uh, my amateur record's nine and one. My total record, when you factor in the rough and rowdy, is nine one and one. Nine one and one, baby. All right, very nice, Chris. Yeah, thank not you. Not bad, right? I mean, there's there's not a governor in the country that can handle me. I promise you that. <laughs> Better than my record. Hey, uh, thanks for your time this morning. Where can people find out more about your campaign for governor? Um, so millerforgovernor.com is out there, and then there's lots of interviews and uh, uh, did a couple of CPAC speeches. So you can check out our uh, um, uh, page on YouTube, too, and that's the same thing. That's millerforgov and millerforgov.com. Thanks, man.